like to call the meeting to order and we want to make sure that it's recording okay. we're good looks good um, thank you all for coming this is the village of Bartlett's proposed downtown TIF district for the uh, um, <clears throat> for the area in the downtown and a little bit bigger than going out east to uh, uh, Prospect Avenue west to uh, the west end of our commercial area north it pretty much encompasses the commercial development so you all have your agendas in front of you we have to uh, then introduce ourselves so why don't we start with Jeff I'm Jeff King I'm the chief operating officer of school district u46 I'm Jim Planzinski with the village of Bartlett community development director Brian Mraz village attorney James Barr, uh, Hanover Township Administrator. Mike Felice, Fire Chief, Bartlett Fire District. Carolyn Hans, Bartlett Public Library Director. Rita Fletcher, Executive Director, Bartlett Park District. Down here. <laughs> um, I will uh, ask you all to speak into the microphone. Make sure the green light is going because we are recording this. So, Donna, your yours is on the base. And with that, Oh, wait, let me, I want to get the condolences. Our village attorney is going to read some things into the record for, that is, uh, meeting notices and that. <clears throat> As Jim stated, this is the Joint Review Board meeting called to order uh, this April 22nd, 2015 at 1 p.m. Uh, for the proposed Village of Bartlett Downtown TIF District uh, and <clears throat> under the statute, all of the taxing bodies in the uh, proposed redevelopment area are, were given notice or uh, should have been given notice. So I'm going to, we introduced who is here, but I want to put into the record who notice was sent to and have Tony uh, advise us what exactly was in that notice. So we have... Ms. Jacqueline Torres, Finance Director, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. Mr. Mark Thomas, Comptroller, Forest Preserve District of Cook County. Ms. Cheryl Stewart Caldwell, Department of Planning and Development, Office of Economic Development, Cook County. Mr. Brian McGuire, Supervisor, Hanover Township. Ms. Mary Jo Imperato, General Assistant, Hanover Township, Dr. Kenneth Arndt, Interim Superintendent, School District U46, Mr. Craig Ochoa, Highway Commissioner, Hanover Township, Dr. David San, President, Elgin Community College, Mr. Michael Sizka, S-Z-Y-S-K-A, Director, Northwest Mosquito, Abatement District, Ms. Carolyn Nance, Director, Bartlett Public Library District, Ms. Valerie Salmons, Village Administrator, Village of Bartlett, Ms. Rita Fletcher, Executive Director, Bartlett Park District, Mr. Lawrence Wilson, Comptroller, Consolidated Elections, Cook County Office, Clerk's Office, uh, Ms. Kristen Vena, Manager, Mental Health Ward, Hanover Township, Mr. Jim Schultz, Acting Director, Department of Commerce and uh, Economic Opportunity of the State of Illinois, and Mr. Michael Felice, Fire Chief of the Bartlett Fire Protection District. Some of you are obviously here. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Fraden, did, do you have uh, evidence that certified that the notice of this hearing along with the plan and the feasibility study have been sent to each of the taxing districts that I just read off? I, I do. I have them right here. They're, they're part of the case file for this project and they were all sent out as, uh, to those parties you read out um, in, in uh, accordance to Illinois TIF statute. And so those you have the green card showing that then they'll be entered in the record. That is correct. Right. 
Um, at this time, I think uh, procedurally we need to elect a public member. So, um, I'll, a, I'll nominate uh, Donna Weir. Second. All those in favor? Well, no. Let's do a roll call. Oh. I need to do a, the uh, okay. We'll do a roll call of oh, those present. Of those present. Where's the sheet? Somebody has it. They're still signing. I'll just do it. I can do it off the top of my head. Jeff King. Yes. Rita Fletcher. Yes. Carolyn Nance. Yes. Mike Felice. Yes. Jim Barr. Yes. And I'll vote yes. So Donna is the public member. Uh, at this point, there should be in a, a selection of a chairperson. So if somebody wants to nominate a chairperson for the meeting. There. I'll nominate Donna Weir. I'll second. <laughs> uh, could we do a roll call on the appointment of Donna Weir as the chairman, chairperson of the meeting? Didn't do it. Carolyn Nance? Yes. <laughs> Rita Fletcher? Yes. Mike Felice? Yes. Jim Barr? Yes. Jeff King? Yes. And Jim Plonzinski will vote yes. So, so Donna's the chair. You can stay there. <laughs> um, the next item is just the review of the board procedures. So our consultants came and kind of are going to handle that. So. Uh, next item on the agenda is a review of the joint review board procedures and duties. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Rishinke with uh, Kate McKenna and colleague uh, Chuck Durham. Uh, we both assisted the uh, village over the last several months as it related to the uh, preparation of the fifth plan as well as the eligibility. Uh, I think in your packet of materials that we handed out today, there's a one or two page cheat sheet which is what I'm going to. Um, back on for the procedures in terms of the what we're doing today. Um, so essentially, uh, the, the joint review board includes several taxing districts which are identified under the ticket. Uh, not all the taxing districts sit at the JRD, um, and sit exactly the Forest Preserve the District or FWRD. Uh, they get notices of the material, they get notices of the villages uh, planning for the area, but uh, they do not get a seat on the joint review board. Um, the Joint Review Board is essentially an advisory body. At the end of the day, uh, the Village Board you know, has a final yes or no on the creation of the 5th District, but your input is important. Um, your input today uh, will be based on the review of the TIF plan uh, that we submitted to you in advance, uh, as well as the eligibility report, which is an appendix there too. And we're going to have a, a short presentation to kind of summarize some of the findings as well as uh, some of the uh, key points of the uh, TIF plan. Um, there's three possible outcomes as it relates to the joint report. Um, you have up to 30 days in which to make your decision on the end of today, and there could be three possible outcomes as identified. One would be uh, you concur with the village's uh, designation of the area as a TIF uh, district, uh, and you concur with their uh, general redevelopment plans as it relates to this area as well as their eligibility findings. Uh, that's one possible path. Uh, second possible path uh, would be you disagree with their findings as a group. I uh, just want to point out that the Act, not the Village, but the TIF Act is specific that has to, as part of your disagreement, it does have to be in writing and it also does have to be specific uh, as it relates to the basis for your disagreement or uh, not concurrence with what you see as the village's plan for the area. Uh, that triggers then uh, potentially another 30 days in which the village has the opportunity to try to sway you or make a better case as it relates to the TIF. Uh, but at the end of that second 30 day period, uh, in the event that the vote or, um, of this board is still negative, again, it does still allow the village board to make the final decision. But the only thing that really changes at that point are the voting rules from the board, rather than a simple majority <coughs> to adopt the TIF district would require a supermajority or uh, three-fifths vote in order to accomplish uh, the designation of the TIF. Uh, the third possible outcome could be that you can't make a decision within that 30-day period. 
Uh, no decision is made by this board here at loggerheads or however you want to categorize it. Again, the TIF Act uh, supersedes basically the TIF Act to say that if no decision is made by the joint review board, that equals a yes. So the chairperson would basically be in a position to report at the public hearing that there was a positive uh, action by the JRB. But again, remember, that positive action basically uh, occurs in this third outcome if there's no action taken by the joint review board uh, within that 30 days. So again, you have three possible outcomes. Uh, it could be a yes or a concurrence with the village's uh, TIF plan or TIF proposal for the area. Second one would be a disagreement. Disagreement uh, does have to be in writing and also specific as to elements of the plan for report. Or thirdly, no action is taken or no decision is made by that board, but uh, that equals a yes. And again, we should have it in that little handout for kind of some of those points. Uh, any questions? If uh, not, Madam Chair, we could go into the, <coughs> if you so desire, we could go into the TIF overview. Yes, the next thing on the agenda is the TIF plan and the TIF eligibility criteria review. Okay, and again, uh, I think you've got the handout as it relates uh, to this material. parts of the older TIF and newer parts and also excludes parts of the old TIF uh, 
uh, is important in order to continue redevelopment to this area. Uh, what we found out over the last seven, eight years uh, is the idea about unlimited growth or growth as it relates to the particular property tax base and valuations, but uh, it's not something you can take for granted. You know, the meltdown that occurred in the real estate markets uh, has impacted not only the region, but also nationally. And um, one of the carryovers that we've seen primarily in Cook County, where property is located in Cook County, is the somewhat of a double gain. Because of the assessment classification system in Cook County, um, although we made some changes recently, uh, Cook County related properties, in particular industrial and commercial, uh, find themselves as a, at a disadvantage you know, in relation to properties that are just across the street or across the border in, you know, Kane County, Kane County, or Lake County, Cook County, et cetera, uh, find themselves at a competitive disadvantage. There has to be some offset, usually, that would induce users to either stand or locate uh, in, uh, in an area where the uh, investors think that the property cash is going to part in order to part of the economy. From the standpoint of why we're here again, I think the last point is important. The village has determined that uh, they're going to be proactive. Uh, given the valuation downturns that have occurred, given some of the delays in projects that were to be instituted that had been uh, implemented and the possibility for improving some of the occupancy within the downtown as well as the condition, uh, the TIF was one of the components that would be required in order to allow to uh, achieve that vision. <coughs> Again, TIF is primarily a financing tool. I mean, the village is counting as a plan, it's a title uh, process, it's permitting processes are still in place, and would be in place in order to direct development. Uh, what TIF does is offer a way to coordinate and marshal some of the uh, private investment is complemented by public investment within a priority area of, of, the, of the village, in this case, the boundaries of the TIF district. From the standpoint of the TIF Act, uh, in order to create a TIF, uh, there have to be a number of footings. One is we have to conform to the comprehensive plan of the village, which we do. Uh, it has to be contiguous parcels. There could be donor holes in the that you can but overall the area has to be contiguous and has to exceed an acre and a half. Again, we uh, meet that. And the village also has to make finding in place to look at this commonly called but for. That but for the implementation or designation of this tip, the kind of redevelopment or development opportunities that we see for this area would not be realized but for the utilization of the tip program. Um, some of this is a little tip 101. I think many of you are better as it relates to the use of tip. I just want to point out, again, TIF is not a new tax. Um, it's basically not uh, an increased assessment. Anything as far as anything associated uh, with increasing the valuation of the area. Under Illinois law, the assessor would continue to assess properties uniformly. The county clerk would continue to extend taxes uniformly. It's the same tax rate in the TIF as outside of the TIF. And property is valued the same way by the assessor in or out of the TIF. Um, what happens with TIF is the bifurcation or split of revenues. The incremental taxes that are created to the TIF uh, basically accrue to a different bucket. Uh, the base taxes or the taxes that are set up uh, or associated with the TIF when it's set up base uh, continue to be uh, collected by the taxing districts as per normal. It's that increase in valuation. It's the blue line. This is the basic model of TIF. You want that blue line to keep going up. Uh, if the blue line goes up, the TIF is successful and incremental revenue is produced to be spent within the TIF to the extent that the blue line uh, does not go over the base, uh, the TIF is really not operating as, as it should. Uh, again, if you expect over the course of a 23-year period, which is the maximum period for the TIF district, uh, there might be some ups and downs, but the idea of being behind the designation is that you overall would expect that as part of the redevelopment efforts uh, that the blue line would continue to go on. And I can say, if we look at some of the slides associated with the eligibility, that has not been the case you know, in this area for the last uh, few years. We've talked a little bit about the joint board, unless there's any questions. 
In order for a TIF to be designated, uh, you not only have to have a plan as it relates to including some of the basic features of the TIF Act, uh, but the area also has to qualify. Uh, what that means is there are certain criteria set out in the TIF Act, what they call eligibility or qualification criteria, and um, they are separated by either an approved area or a vacant area. This area is largely an approved area. There's a further bifurcation between a blighted area or conservation area. Conservation area being the softer standard. You only need three out of 13 factors as opposed to five. And again, it's usually categorized by older buildings. 50% or more of the buildings have to be 35 years old or greater. These are the 13 factors that are set forth in the TIF Act. And as a finding of a conservation area, it's required that three of these factors uh, must be present and distributed throughout the area. Uh, Payment antenna and village uh, staff in the immediate area. And we found that we passed the first threshold, which is 50% or more of the buildings are 35 years old or greater. In fact, almost 70% are uh, in terms of the age factor. And then six other factors were identified for some of the folks, you know, site visits that we undertook and consultation with uh, village staff and uh, engineering. Uh, first factor we identified was the sets of vacancies. Um, and this primarily was reflected in terms of uh, the commercial buildings, uh, a key property, again, at the south end here, Devon, uh, is the shopping center where the old food store uh, was located, part of the food. Um, but there's also been interspersed throughout numerous vacancies in some of the um, standalone buildings or some of the buildings where you basically have multi tenants as well. About 24% of the buildings were partially or completely vacant. And um, we also found that these vacancies, in many cases, were sustained or persistent. Uh, basically, have been in play for more than one year. So it's not just your normal turnover where you could expect maybe somebody leaves and then the property is filled up in the next five or six months. These are sustained vacancies and our discussions with Tony Frey who had been uh, in the forefront here with respect to interested users, we identified a number of issues in you know, terms of properties. You know, one has to do with the overall financial environment in terms of lenders um, looking for more loan to value. Secondly, Cook County taxes as it related to operating expenses associated with some of these structures and the uh, tightness in the uh, lending industry. Most likely, either going to be a slight 
track or maybe stabilize. We don't expect any real stabilization to maybe the guess is 2015 or 2016. Third factor we identify is deterioration. It's more of a physical factor. Uh, the most of the deterioration was related to uh, site improvements in the parking lots or uh, driveways, some of the street sidewalk areas. <coughs> but we also did find that in some of the buildings, uh, some of the older buildings, whether it was the rear portion, of the, uh, stairwells, uh, window frames, door frames, we noticed. Uh, we know that that is wrong. And again, this is just a, a, a sample of some of the pictures. Uh, we, we've got some more as it relates to this area. For each property, uh, we completed the site survey. She also had a, a pictorial uh, exhibit that would accompany uh, all the properties. Uh, fourth uh, factor that we see is obsolescence. So this, can be defined as a known known in different ways. One, you know, in terms of common appraisal parlance, either functional or economic obsolescence. And, uh, that's the economic obsolescence, uh, as well as functional, often tied to the marketplace of how the market perceives properties. Uh, and, and that ties in again to the age and what we've seen on that other chart as it relates to the, to the valuation of the client and some of the vacancies. So some of the properties literally here in this area have fallen. Uh, some both from a larger property standpoint as in the shopping center or some of the smaller single user properties uh, that are part of downtown. Uh, the third thing we identified is that, and this really more has to do with um, the village has been planning in this area as opposed to comprehensive plans and other work they've done. This really speaks more to the characteristics of the structures when they were originally constructed as it relates to what our requirements now. Most of these buildings were uh, designed or built before the original uh, building campaign. The plan came to uh, play uh, things as it relates to the uh, railroad right away, some of the requirements as it relates to uh, both uh, traffic and parking. Uh, buildings, again, most many of these buildings as it relates to, especially the, the older ones, you know, in terms of setbacks, requirements for loading or unloading and parking. Again, if they were built today, they have different characteristics. These are characteristics that have to take care of for unified development, whether it's common parking areas, whether it's more strategic uh, identification for loading and unloading purposes. Work would have to be done in order to bring uh, many of the structures back to productive use. Uh, last element, uh, what's related to that? And, you know, the system requirements here um, were identified as relating primarily to age, but also to their condition. Um, there had to be uh, widespread replacement for many of the uh, systems, both sanitary and water main, and it would be part of, let's say, any ongoing redevelopment, whether there was increased density within the uh, downtown or just from planning. You know, in terms of planning for future uses and having more modern uh, or reliable infrastructure. And again, you know, as part of our record, we're looking into this, we looked at the um, logs related to both repairs and concerns that the um, professionals had as related to the condition of the infrastructure. So, figure we'll digress a little bit here. So, again, in terms of qualification, in Texas, you have to pick your poison. Are you a conservation area? Are you a blighted area? Findings we have here relate to conservation area. Key threshold finding for conservation area are, and again, this is the ticket, 50% or more of the buildings have to be 35 years old or greater. We have 69% here. And then once you pass that threshold factor, out of the 13 factors identified in the fact, we have identified three. Uh, we've identified six. Again, these are just summaries as it relates to uh, that information. Uh, there's someone, or some of this is uh, detailed or identified in a little more broad uh, way inside the eligibility report. But if, and I'm sure if you want, if there's any questions as it relates to the eligibility, we could do that now, or we could move on to the summary of the plan. Whatever the pleasure of the board.
The TIF plan, as I explained earlier, because if you're looking at the TIF plan that you all saw, you know, it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have things like, well, we're going to have this type of awning on Main Street, or we're going to uh, have setbacks of this type along Prospect. It's, it's not that kind of plan. There's, a, there's some key language in the plan which basically kind of shifts things over. It says that this plan will conform with not only the comprehensive plan of the village department, but any other PUDs or any other amendments there too. So this financing plan, so to speak, will go lockstep with whatever the vision of the community is as it relates to the actual kind of planning requirements, things like lines, streetscape, setbacks, parking requirements. That's all handled in a, in a different kind of plan. What this plan basically does is it'll identify some of the main features that the TIF Act requires us. One is the geography. You got to set out those boundaries because that's what you spend in the TIF plan. Uh, secondly, the term of the, in this case, 23 years is the uh, term of the TIF. You have to have a budget identified for the taxing districts what we think we're going to spend in this area. What's more important is the ceiling. Uh, and also identify general types of land uses and redevelopment objectives, which, which we don't we piggyback from the comprehensive plan and some other documents that the villages put together. What are some of the objectives for the downtown and, and how we hope to achieve them? On a practical level, as the plan is implemented, it would really be implemented through a series of either redevelopment agreements, uh, which are agreements between the village and uh, development entities whether they're developers or private businesses in the TIF, and its expenditures as it relates to things that they would spend money on. So back a little bit. And the Joint Review Board, your work's not done today. After you know, today, you would meet annually as it relates to this area. And you'd also receive uh, the village's independent audit in terms of those things I just described, how our expenditures, where they're going, how much revenue came in, how are you benchmarking for the plan? And there would be a report which is also filed with the State of Illinois the Controller's Office, which is then again shared with the taxing districts. And this board convenes annually in order to review the record of the TIF, so to speak. Um, based on the information we have from Cook County, the base CAD or that red line that we saw, or that first bucket that we saw, in which the districts uh, continue to uh, be able to extend their taxes against is 18 million 584 and some change. Uh, the projected AAV, and this is dependent on market factors, and you know, this is our best guess at this time. <coughs> you know, if growth rates increase, we use the conservative growth rate, you know, percent and a half or two percent. Obviously, if you go back to the old days when it was four or five percent, that number could increase, but that was, you know, the guess based upon. Uh, information that we had, uh, and that's good. Yeah, these are requirements that you have to have for the TIF Act. Um, projected the AD is 30 to 35 million. Again, premised on the fact it's dependent on the market, uh, and it's also dependent on the county and the overall growth pattern that you're going to see. The TIF budget is uh, 17 million. Five. That's, again, another guess. It's a little bit of a harder number as it relates to the guess, because this is the number that. You know, if it succeeded, you have to come back to the Joint Review Board as it relates to an amendment, a formal amendment to the plan. But uh, this is, again, an guesstimate over the term of the TIF as to what the, the village thinks it may need in order to assist in redevelopment within the area and also provide for uh, any public improvements there, too. The land uses are similar to what we have on mixed uses, essentially working off the uh, transportation elements of the, of the downtown, its central location or location as it relates to providing both things like restaurant uses, smaller shops, uh, and uh, convenience goods uh, for the consumers and residents that surround the area. This is the budget again. The budget allows for, because we're doing our best guess at this time for a 22 year uh, period, the TIF Act does allow you to shift monies between the categories. Uh, you know, based on uh, consultation again with staff, you know, two large elements in here relate to the utility improvements again, based on what we saw in terms of the inadequate utility finding. 
and rehabilitation or renovation type programs. You know, that would have some sensitivity as it relates to the older buildings that are located within the area as well as some of the existing buildings. And, uh, you know, I think from a market standpoint, you're not looking at Walmart or Kohl's coming into this area. You're looking at working with smaller local businesses, maybe some regional businesses, depending on uh, the character of So you're really looking at more of a grassroots kind of infill program here. Uh, and, and that's why the rehab number is so <coughs> large. So again, the total is uh, 17 and a half million. We'll wait for the last item and suggest that in the event that residential properties are developed and um, there are new children, school-aged children, or library patrons associated with the um, development. The TIF Act does provide for a, a safe harbor. Um, the school district can submit uh, a claim every year, as can the library district, uh, for reimbursement from the TIF, for payment for new patrons, or for new school-aged children if that property was the beneficiary of a redevelopment agreement and it's a residential property, not commercial or, or retail, um, a sorry purpose. You have to get better lobbyists. And uh, that goes in by September 1st of every year. Then uh, there are restrictions, uh, and that's a formula within the TIF. For library districts, it's up to 2%. Um, that's the camp of the residential increment associated with the project. And there's a multiplier that you have. I think it used to come out of Springfield. So per capita number for operating expenses used to be anywhere $150, $170 per patron. You use that times the patrons, and then the village makes a determination of what's in, in the amount for you, and that's paid on an annual basis. Or return. And for the school district, it gets either 30 or 40% of the increment and regardless of what that number is, the, the village has to, to pay that out. If, if it turns out that there's a bonanza of school-aged children or library patrons here who are required uh, to change that, we would have to amend the plan. I mean, by, by law, we'd have to go back and amend the plan in order to accommodate the claims of both the library and the, and the school district. So that's serious. Again, it's an overall budget number. Uh, don't get fixed too much on those exact line items. Uh, the key is the bottom number and the fact that, uh, again, as it relates to what I call the statutory payments for the school or for the library, uh, those amounts are, it's a first lien in, in effect. I mean, to the extent that you make the justification uh, for those amounts, the village does have to pay those amounts out pursuant to the formula and the camps that are set forth. Um, again, all we're trying to identify here is this part of a larger process. I mean, we just didn't come into this, the village just didn't come into this. I think I'd be nice to have another thing. There, there's a, a method to, to the madness as it relates to, again, the downtown has continued to be an important uh, policy area for the village, be it both the standpoint of the elected officials uh, and their interpretation of what they do constituents line as it relates to this area. Uh, secondly, in consultation with staff, you know, independently, you know, we've identified uh, the area deficiencies that are in and, and again, TIF, not unlike some other towns, is, is a possible way to try to address some of those deficiencies. Um, and again, the idea being at the end of the 23 year period, or if it's shorter, um, when you turn the keys of the car the act, the value, we would have followed that model on that fourth or fifth slide, that the, the value is going up. So where we are now, we're about halfway through the, the process. Um, we sent out notices to all the taxing districts to the state and the interested parties. All the residential addresses within 750 feet have been notified. Uh, all of this public here, the end of the, the game plan, so to speak, is to have this public hearing kind of coordinating those comments. Uh, we still have uh, two newspaper notices to be published and notices to all the taxpayers uh, of record with the TIF that's going to occur in the next couple of weeks. 
So uh, the public hearing will occur on June second in, uh, in this building at seven. Seven o'clock. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're invited to the, to the ten as well as your attendance here tonight or today. And no action will be taken on the second. The village, pursuant to the TIF Act, you have to have a cooling off period, so to speak. You have to wait two weeks, but no more than 90 days in which to adopt the ordinances. And the reason for that hiatus is to you know, basically digest any comments that have been received at that point, give the board uh, consider any input uh, also from the Trump Review Board. Uh, as well as from the general public and stakeholders with, uh, within the tip. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for your patience. So I have, uh, I have a couple. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, we have before you the TIF ordinances that are on the dais, and uh, those need to be uh, reviewed as well. Yes, so, uh, essentially, you have an ordinance approving of the Village Apartment Downtown Tax Increment Financing Redevelopment Project, or a redevelopment project. So the plan and the project documents that were previously sent to you and summarized. Uh, you then have an ordinance that approves of the redevelopment project area, which is the map that the map. of the area that we're talking about. And then lastly, there's an ordinance that adopt, adopts tax increment financing for the village of Bartlett in connection with this area, uh, the project area that we've talked to, approved by the second ordinance and uh, in accordance with the, the plan and the project. So these would go to the village board after the public hearing. That's the 14 days. Uh, cooling off period, be the soonest the board could adopt it, the latest would be 90 days after that. So. Also, if one correction is pointed out to me by Chuck. For the school districts, your unit district, Correct. Right, it's actually 25% of the residential mm -hmm. uh, in, in a given year, that's the, that's the key. Not 30 days, it's for different districts. No. Oh. I didn't mean to interrupt questions, no, so okay. I just wanted, I was just following the order of the agenda, so. Okay. So, based on the, the presentation, do I interpret that there's about 18 residents incorporated in the boundaries of the proposed uh, tip? There's okay. Okay. And then there's some second floor residential along the uh, both Bartlett and um, uh, Bonita. Okay. And then we also have, if you go along Oak, at the near North Avenue, there's about uh, six single family residences along, uh, along that area. Okay. So I assume most of them are occupied. Do we have any idea? Yeah, from what we can tell from just uh, uh, exterior site survey, uh, you know, looking at things like mailboxes and uh, okay. passing any corvette sites, it appears you know, most of those most of those were right. So then, w I'm assuming the intent would be it's n there, the intent is not to change them from residence to something else, or will that be determined at some other point? I, I have to tell you, part of that will be determined. The key determinant on all of this. So it depends on the interest you it get. It depends on the interest. Okay. Some of these, what I would call maybe um, more marginal uses, so to speak, are come about. The reason they're not, let's say, maybe commercial or office, is because you don't have the foot traffic or the interest there. And as a result, it's easier for a landlord then to right. uh, go to residential route. I mean, to the extent that you could make 
a higher rent or achieve a higher return if it could go to office or service. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. It would, it I understand. Would depend on, on, on the market. Okay. Totally. That it? Yep. Could you take a second, sir, and just like you said, at the at the very beginning, you talked about the options. Oh, uh, sure. J just one more time, if you would. Yes, please. Not a problem. Uh, we give you three possible outcomes by, for the joint review board. One would be uh, that you concur or you agree and, and provide a positive recommendation uh, to the village regarding the, the plan that you have and their findings uh, of eligibility that the area is in conservation area. That's number one. Number two would be, these are your typical yeah, gang. Not trying to sway you either way. Uh, the, the, the second, it relates to if you find that there's a negative vote. You don't agree, you disagree with the finding of the, of the eligibility or um, you don't concur with the villages, let's say, redevelopment objectives for this area. I just want to point out that that vote has to be accompanied by uh, a written objection that's specific as to why you object. And, and I think legislatively, legislatively, if you look at the record, why that came in, you know, what the legislature was trying to avoid was, oh, we just don't like TIFs, that kind of thing that would basically come up at, at many of the hearings. The legislature was trying to have a focus uh, related more to the specific case uh, in front of you. And then the third uh, possible outcome is there is in effect, no option. You, you don't vote, you don't come up with um, a recommendation, you're up or down, and, and, and you choose, uh, or for whatever reason, you can't come to groups with it, but that equals a yes. And, and, and again, uh, that is specified in the statute. I just have a follow up question. Chair, Ms. Madam Chairman, in the negative finding, the, the is it the Joint Review Board who has to come up with the written findings or the individual no votes in the negative finding? It's the Joint Review Board. The way we read it, it's, it's an action right? of, the board. Action of the board. Right. So then the board would, just to carry that out, the board would have to then undertake its own study of the TIF area to determine that those six factors found to be the criteria for the conservation area are in fact not there. That's what we've seen in the past. When we've had um, a negative vote, uh, basically that, that was a requirement and that's what we've seen the JRB uh, basically undertake their own examination or utilization outside professionals. And then who usually pays for that? Uh, in, that in all the cases that we've been involved in, I'm not saying this is the whole universe, I'll be careful. In the cases we've been involved in, it's usually one taxing district or several taxing districts that have shared their cost. It is uh, where you're going, it's really not the means of that. Thank you. The village is we, supposed to, excuse me, we just have uh, just. Uh, Cook County's representative Courtney Pogue just arrived, so thank you, Courtney. I know you were stuck in traffic. Thank you. Thank you. So that will be entered in the record. Uh, uh, under the TIF Act, the, uh, the village provides administrative support, so we can type up the report, but um, as to the bases, for an objection that are supposed to be tied to the statutory criteria, the village would not be obligated to, uh, you know, hire consultants to refute what you just heard. So if there's an objection in, uh, in a, this hearing, this board can be adjourned and reconvened, but again, the time is ticking in terms of when the report needs to be done, which would be within 30 days of today. Can I ask one more question around what you had asked, Jim? So so in my case, the, our, our board hasn't rendered any guidance. 
So um, I would probably not vote yes or no, but after getting guidance from the board, then would I have to submit something in writing? Or how would, or how? because my understanding is a, a vote of nothing, so I abstain from voting, that's a that's yes, nice. yeah. correct? Well, the way you, I interpret it. Well, it's actually the board's decision, and there, there is no decision by the board. That's how the TIF Act reads. Okay. You know, if, what you would do individually, and I'll defer to Brian, is really going to depend on Robert School's order as it relates to things like abstentions or. Okay. Right. So, um, U46 could submit an objection in the future, even if you're not prepared to recommend uh, or to vote no. Okay. Correct. Yeah, I just don't know. Uh, but either it's way. not I part of you know. the report then. Got it. Uh, and those comments can be part of public. Yes. As well. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Brian, can I ask a quick question? So, if we vote no, I, if we vote no, mm -hmm. that's not good enough. Not under the statute. You need a basis. The basis. Uh, to approve or disapprove has to be based on the criteria. Uh, okay. You want to reiterate that you don't feel the criteria is met, you I, could state that. I think, I don't know if I can speak for my counterparts, but I think the fact that now we're being told that we would have to pay to hire someone to oppose this is a little surprising, and I'm questioning if the village trustees knew this is part of it for us to have to look into this as opposed to getting our opinion. Well, you can vote no, uh, or you vote to disprove it, but the way the statute reads, the uh, valid uh, vote of disapproval is supposed to be based on the fact that it doesn't meet the statutory criteria as a conservation area not just, again, generally we don't like it. Now, there's no, you, uh, you don't, nothing says in the act you must hire a, uh, a TIF consultant or someone else to refute the finding that's before you. You know, it just, the basis is supposed to be uh, addressed to the criteria, not just a general we don't like TIFs, so you could, you know, couch it in those terms. Uh, it's not mandated that there be a, a separate study to back that up. And again, if I could, that's well put by Brian. I mean, we've seen that. I mean, in some cases, the districts have wanted it to carry it further in terms of their objection and taking it to a different level, so to speak. I think the intent of the act is that you just can't vote no and leave it at that. You would have to identify some specific elements of the plan or specific elements of the eligibility that are concerned at the heart of it. So, Bob, in regards to some of these uh, quali qualifying factors as it relates to the issue, creation of this TIF district. Um, could you go into a little detail? I know I came in late in regards to the obsolescence, what's taking place within the, in the actual TIF district, um, also deterioration as far as some the structures, and also the excessive vacancies. Why is it excessive vacancy within the village of Bartlett as it relates to this actual TIF district? Things have started to improve over the last few years, 
That might have been a number that we saw in 2010 or 2011, but is at the higher side of what we're, we're seeing now for whether it's, and these were sustained vacancies too. You know, not your normal turnover, let's say of space. Tenant ABC leaves, takes three months to fill it up. We didn't, we were trying not to count those kind of vacancies, but ones that have been sustained uh, within the area. And, uh, so it's the issue of credit vacancy taking place within this actual TIFF district, right. and it's typically a higher retail vacancy, simply about 10% from the market, so right. you're definitely we above market. Yeah, we were seeing uh, amounts of access to that, and again, visible locations for the greater spot, you know, whether it was along uh, the railroad right away by the train station or whether it was like the, you know, the shopping center uh, use, they, they were also, again, if you look in the TIFF Act, uh, it's adverse influence as it relates to not only the location but the duration of the, of the vacancy. So that's what we identified. Again, in consultation with Tony Frady, um, you know, who's been in the, in the trenches on this stuff, you know, we found that a lot of the concerns, you know, had to do with, uh, sorry for this, but Cook County taxes and... Uh, Don't blame us for everything. Yeah, you, can't, you can't take care of everything. Right? And, and uh, the, you know, age and you know, some of the structures in terms of things like whether it's communications or electric or even sprinklers, you know, again, some of the older buildings did not have a lot of, a lot of the modern uh, characteristics. And that's going to also get into the obsolescence. This, this was a big one, you know, and this tied into partly, you know, what we saw in the lag in EAV over the, over the period of time. You know, we had five straight years of decline, five straight years where it was below the CPI. Uh, four out of five years for a lag behind uh, the village as a whole. Um, you know, partly that's again due to the loss in valuation due to uh, occupancy or, or lack thereof, and the fact that many of the old buildings are kind of appreciated and as a useful life and we're kind of at the bottom of the valuation spectrum. So is that also tied into some of the findings we made on uh, obsolescence as well, this chart? So are you finding more or less because of the lagging EAV and typically more success valuation, because of the assessed uh, vacancy, most of the owners are going in for the deduction with the Cook County Assessor as far as getting the property, as far as the vacancy allowance? We'd actually like to see that. That would show some more interest in, to, in, in, in the area. The, the, the problem, as I understand it, is the lack of interest, whether with a Class 7 or, or Basically, yeah, the whole idea here is trying to get some interest so folks would either expand, uh, refurbish, or repopulate some of the, uh, the vacant structures that we see here. You know, again, you know, it's, it's similar to when you missed my little speech, you know, this is not different from other stuff that we've looked at in other older downtowns. I mean, a lot of retail commercial uh, is driven by things like parking and exposure or visibility. Uh, it, it is downtowns, uh, as the area around downtowns have grown, you know, your ability to have that kind of traffic, to have that kind of uh, exposure as a result has diminished. I mean, people are going to, you know, whether it's, you know, Randall Road, as, you know, as an example, people, retailers tend to congregate at more heavily trafficked areas. The challenge in downtowns has been more of a grassroots infill challenge to try to keep some of the local retailers here and have them expand or get similar retailers um, to to locate. And, and again, that is a tale of two cities. The smaller guys, it's a mixed blessing. The smaller guys are good candidates for downtowns, but they also have less access to capital. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. Where something like TIF comes in is it can offer an offset, whether it's through rehabilitation for tenant improvements being funded through uh, through TIF or through coordination of things like common parking, site assembly, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's why we thought that the TIF, again, is a good candidate for downtown given some of the constraints that we see uh, both geographically and market. So the lack of tapping into the potential sales tax dollars is not there because of the excessive vacancy that's, to retail? Well, you could see. This alone, that, that food store closure, you know, based on its size, and, and you know, I'll take this to the bank, but based on our you know, review of food stores at that size, 
You know, they could be doing anywhere between 15 and 20 million dollars a year, on average. So the fact that it's closed and nothing's there, you know, that's essentially 150,000 at minimum that you lose in terms of sales tax. Same with a lot of the restaurant users, a couple of them that are closed. I mean, a restaurant with a liquor license could do anywhere from a million to two million dollars a year in sales. And again, that's lost income, uh, both on property taxes for the districts, sales tax for the village, and you know, jobs for the wider community. So, I, I mean, there is a ripple effect as it relates to um, vacancies uh, within the downtown. So, you know, and so that ties in with your point about the you know, obsolescence and also the, the land EAD. You know, deterioration, as I indicated, was primarily found more on the site improvements than the parking lot driveways. Um, we did find that some of the buildings, primarily some of the older buildings, you know, in, in the rear area, and components, uh, you know, door frames, window frames, deeper tunnels, we did see that. And, and primarily, if you look at it on a tax parcel basis, the you know, majority over, you know, of, of the tax parcels did identify or were identified with some element of deterioration. So it was widespread. It was not just only a couple of properties. So if we're deferred maintenance stay and deterioration exactly. associated. Exactly. I mean, it really starts to tie in when you see properties that have experienced vacancies. They don't have the income in which to support. Um, and here's an example. Shopping center, that, you know, you don't have the income in which to support things like parking lot maintenance, which can be expensive, lighting standards, um, facades. You basically see deferred maintenance as a result of the fact that you have little income. So basically, the deferred maintenance and the op deterioration has led to a, a lack of full realization of the actual assessed valuation for these properties. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, from a real estate standpoint, to get a little bit of a spiral effect, which is why I think the village decided, hey, you know, from a proactive standpoint, we, we are concerned with what we see here, we're concerned with the overall trend, and I think they want to position themselves, and we've seen this not only in Florida, but other towns, as the economy is uh, hopefully improving, you want to be at a point where you're positioning yourself to take um, you know, take advantage of whatever improvement in the marketplace that you can and realign your properties with um, hopefully improvements in the market. In our, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Could you describe or discuss the, the footprint difference between uh, this proposed TIF and the recently, uh, recently expired downtown TIF? I could do it. Yeah. yeah, if you just go back to the map, mm -hmm. the old TIF district pretty much ended at Berteau Avenue on the east and went down. And then the, the bulk of the west part from Berteau up to North Avenue was the old TIF district. We went down to Devon. It didn't include uh, the Hillcrest Apartments, but... If you recall, and I don't know how long you've been here, but I'm a little older than you, Jim, where, where the town center is, that was vacant factory buildings mm -hmm. and an auto center and a gas station. So it included where the, uh, if you can kind of see where it says not included in district, the north part of that, there's those three buildings. Those are there. Those were in the district, and that was the back of those vacant abandoned uh, factory buildings that the TIF district re demolished and we did the environmental cleanup and um, redeveloped it. So it, it's basically the stuff west of Berteau and then everything except for that Hillcrest apartment kind of street. And, and kind of projecting forward with this TIF district, you know, what is it that you, you know, would like to see, you know, I guess in broad strokes occur? Obviously you mentioned from the first downtown TIF, some major redevelopments, some remediation, utility improvement, road improvements. Uh, and they're kind of broadly outlined in the budget. And, and I know we're just laying out a, a broad blueprint, but could you describe 
some of what you know you'd like to uh, see you know occur during the life of the TIF. As part of um, the process, as Bob explained, it's a financial plan. Hmm. As part of uh, the TIF district, kind of came out of an analysis that the <coughs> board directed our economic development commission to do about improving the downtown area and what steps to be taken. And so the TIF was one of those, explore the TIF. The other item that was done was also to apply for what is called an RTA grant for a transit-oriented development plan for the downtown. Ideally, and, and we got that grant, ideally the way it was designed originally, that plan would have already been underway to give the more specifics that Bob's talking about were, you know, we'd like to see redevelopment occur on these parcels and we'd like to then get into the nuts and bolts of, you know, what would, what would be a nice commercial center at this location, maybe redevelop these vacant abandoned buildings at this corner. Um, we, we also identified the streetscape as a little tired and we've, we've have a corridor plan that we instituted going out west. We'd like to bring that more into the downtown. The EDC looked at taking it up uh, Oak Avenue north to the edge of the TIF with the banners and the new street lights, so those types of things. And, and those kinds of, you know, we'd like to make some of the bike trail links. So the plan, unfortunately, is still, we're, we're in the selection of the consultant right now. But that will occur in the summer and over the next several months. And the, the plan will be developed. The TIF financially helps implement that plan. And that's ideally what we'd like to see. And, you know, we'd like to see commercial mixed-use development um, occur on the, on the major corners and in some of the, the vacant buildings. You could do some land assembly, some of the older buildings. You could buy the, you know, I'm not going to point out buildings, but you could buy one of these vacant buildings and combine it with the property next door and do something nice. Very good. Uh, some follow-up questions. These may go back, back to you, Bob. But on the qualification factors, um, you just certainly described some of them in good detail, but I had, again, follow-up questions uh, regarding, for instance, the first one on the uh, listed here, uh, excessive vacancies. In the TIF Act, is there a definition of excessive vacancies? The only thing uh, that we have for guidance, the one that's really the most precise is that numeric one, the mm -hmm. lag or decline in EAB. Yeah. For the other ones, uh, it, it, it's a little more general. Uh, part of it has to do with uh, practitioners and looking at the market. All it says is a uh, vacancies of a diverse nature that are sustained or in a visible location. That's really all the guidance you get from, from the uh, TIF Act. So, you know, in order to be honest about it, you know, we look at things like what are the, you know, important to mention, you know, for most typical commercial vacancies in the market, that's about 10 percent. So we use that as kind of a benchmark, even greater than that. And then we also looked at it in terms of discussions with, uh, you know, Tony Freight and then Jim. What's the duration, you know, for, for some of these folks? You know, uh, has it been over a year? Has it been over six months? And then you look at the condition, too, like when we look at the parking lot and the shopping center. And you can see some of the impacts of deferred maintenance. So it's a combination of things from a practitioner's end. What we try to do is keep to the intent of the TIF Act, where we, you know, they might have only a one sentence or two sentence definition. The idea being is that you want to be faithful to the intention, and um, but we don't get any numeric guidance on that. And in the case of the excessive vacancies, uh, as a point of reference, do you know what you mentioned prior what it was maybe as a general rule of thumb. Do we know what it is for the village as a whole? Uh, that, I, that I couldn't tell. Uh, you know, we, we could find that out. Okay. But I, I couldn't tell you that. Uh, James, under the TIF Act, the, under this conservation, they just define excess or they, when they're listing that criteria, it says, with respect to excessive vacancies, the presence of buildings that are unoccupied or underutilized and that represent an adverse influence on the area because of the frequency, extent, or duration of the vacancies, which is basically what Bob said. Okay. And there are things, Chuck pointed out, there is a report, too. 
terms of a section, I think on page six to eight or thereabouts, there's a recitation of so in regards to the village, in regards to the shopping center, uh, what has been some of your marketing efforts for that vacant shopping center and what were some of the comments you've gotten back from some of the retailers who have tried to look at that? If you had some retailers look at the center, what was some of the feedback you got from them in regards to um, that subject site? Well, Tony's been, we, we've run lots of people through that shopping center, worked with the property owners. The most recent interest was by a company that owns, they, they, they own nine or ten existing centers, Tony, that they've done, that are tired centers that they've rehabbed. I won't mention their name. But they were the most interested in this center. And they basically said, if there's no TIF the bill, and, and no redevelopment agreement, that we would not purchase the center. And they had a contract on it. And the contract was supposed to have lapsed at the end of March, and we haven't heard from them because whether the owner didn't renew that or gave them a contract extension, we've told them where we're at in the TIF process, and they're kind of taking a wait-and-see attitude. But that's, I mean, they were pretty blunt about it, and we've, we've sat down with them over numerous times. And that ties into you know, that about four finding as it relates to the, you know, whether TIF can make a difference. And it, that but for designation, I know that's an important one for TIF. Uh, I thought that it had to do primarily with EAV. No, it, well, it, it could. It, it only shows up in one sentence, really, in the whole TIF. And usually, you know, the way it's interpreted, the way it's utilized in, in, in real life, is first and foremost to see it as part of the original designation. Is why would the municipality designate this area with these characteristics as opposed to another area? You, um, so you look for things like we did that are deficient or you could show that there's been a decline or some erosion uh, of values over the years. The second place it really shows up is when there is a specific redevelopment agreement you know, along the lines of what Jim was talking about, that the village makes a determination that well, for the TIF, you know, they wouldn't provide those dollars. So you see like on a macro level, is, that was really one of the reasons why you're looking for your cooperation as it relates to setting this up uh, in terms of that but for the TIF, we're really not going to see that improvement. And then on an implementation basis, you know, it's part of each and every redevelopment. And the village makes a finding as it relates to why it's giving assistance. So it's, a, again, macro and micro level. And then on the lagging and uh, declining EAV, you know, it, all of the property within, you know, an aggregate in the village and, and our whole area has been declining pretty well for the last five years. So it was very likely you could choose any five or any parcels throughout this area and, and find that they had declining below at least, you know, CPI. Right. But, but, but two things. One, I think it's, it's what we tried to show on that chart is that even you do see that the village has been declining as in you guys have all experienced declines. But the decline here is a little deeper. And then the second thing that you know was of concern to both the village and you know when we looked at this area was the ability to bounce out. Uh, you know, it's not magically going to occur. If, if you continue or persist at vacancies, that value. I mean, if you have sophisticated owners, they're going to protest their taxes based on the fact that they don't have income. And secondly, you, you know, for especially for some of the older properties, I mean, there's properties, you know, in the area that are 82. So, you know, as it relates to their ability to improve their value, and the only way they really improve their value is either through <coughs> increase in rents um, and increase in their, um, you know, building stock, you know, whether they improve their electrical system or communication system so they could get $15 rents as opposed to $6. I mean, it's just the same way downtown. You know, get class, that's why the classification is class A. Class B, Class C office buildings. Class A could command thirty-five, forty dollars a foot. Class B maybe half of that. And Class A, you're a month to month, or Class C, I should say, you're a month to month. 
So, you know, a big part of this is understanding what it is that we have to work with. You know, and you're right. I mean, the environment has not been kind to any uh, equalized assessed valuation, but the concern here is that it's been a little worse, and secondly, uh, the ability to bounce out, to bounce back. Oh, one last question, then I'll let these other folks go ahead. Uh, looking at some of the other qualification factors, just in general, deterioration, obsolescence, et cetera, for these also the TIF Act has no definition or benchmark of what is considered? Correct. I mean, for obsolescence, for example, is the condition of falling in uh, to disuse or the buildings not utilized for the function for which it was initially intended. And you see that a little bit here in terms of the disuse and conversion to some of the single-family Structures that you see along uh, oak, you know, been converted to commercial use. You see some of that in uh, a couple other parts of the downtown. So I mean, you, you know, again, the idea of being that okay, the TIF Act only gives you uh, the general guidance. You know, part of the reason that, that we're involved we, you know, is we built up, you know, back, uh, you know, loads of experience related to. You know, we've done about 300 of these, and, and you, at a certain point, you get. Well, is it a TIF or is it not a TIF? And, and, and that experience and you know the totality of the of, of the findings really, like I said, I think we know what's a TIF or what's not. When um, Bob, when you mentioned the. Um on that vote, I just want to kind of clarify. Maybe it's a question for Brian. I'm not, I'm not sure. I understood what you just said, that the vote is whether we believe that the report meets the qualification factors. I'm not sure if I'm reading that the same as what's on the agenda. It's actually two things. It, it would be, and I'm sorry if I didn't make it clear. You're looking at not only the report on the qualification, but also on, quote, the redevelopment plan you know, itself with the village's objectives for what they want to see in this area. I think Jim gave it, you know, mixed use, you know, primarily some combination of public improvements that complement, um, you know, the, the, the train station as well as any other private development. It's really, I mean, I think the way the resolution is stated for the record, you know, if you're looking at the redevelopment plan and the, and the element, there. so it's, it's, it's a, it's a combo here. Because ultimately, that eligibility report, you guys, that's only an appendix to the TIF plan. The TIF plan basically says, okay, first we find that the area qualifies on the TIF Act, and here's what we want to do with the TIF. This is, you know, these are some of our goals and objectives for the area. You know, for example, we didn't have anything in here that said it was going to be, uh, you know, an industrial uh, park or a rendering plant or hospital, I mean, that kind of stuff. If we change those kind of land uses, we have to come back you know, to the joint review board. Really what we're seeing is a continuation uh, with maybe some differences for where stuff was located, but it, it, it's basically, basically a kind of, uh, you know, continuation of mixed use that would complement not only the downtown, but also the transit area. And then, and then, if this board, uh, the majority were to say no, mm -hmm. then the option then um, we would have the we, we don't necessarily have the obligation, but if we would have to, we, we would have to provide another report that justifies as a whole. Then or just to it. I, I, I don't want to. Sell what I, what I had mentioned before, because what we have seen in the past is some towns they do, or some taxing districts they do bring in, you know, their own folks. Uh, you know, the other joint reviewers may say, I think we're, if I understood Brian correctly, how he interpreted it is you would have to be specific. You would have to say, okay, we are not in accord with these redevelopment objectives for, you know, the downtown on page three of the, uh, of the plan, or we don't think these two factors, you know, the case has been made. Uh, for, for, for these two factors. I, I, I think that would be a starting point. Again, you know, the TIFAC is many things. One of it is, 
one of them is, is brevity. So you don't get a lot of just you know, in response to your questions about you know are there benchmarks or are there any numerics in there? Not really. I, I mean, you know, part of this you have to go back on uh, experience with what we've seen and what we think the impact of the act is. But I, I as a as I understand it, though, and Mike, maybe this might help you. If you say no, it doesn't meet the the finding of excessive vacancies. There has to be some kind of documentation that it doesn't meet that. I mean, if it's if it's got 69 percent of vacant structures, you can say no, it doesn't meet that. Somebody's got to go out and figure out. Well, it's only 50 percent, or it's only 20 percent. Right, but the so proof would be kind of thing. the proof would be on us, even though you indicated that there is no benchmark indicated in the TAP. In, in the there, again, there has to be some to follow. What Jim said some basis for the for the disagreement. Where the you know where they went with this in '99 when the changes uh, to the TIF Act occurred is, you know, they basically said to the taxi group, why are the taxi districts to be in a <laughs> position that if you are as a majority going to disagree, you give the municipality something they could hang their hand on to try to pursue, you know, persuade you otherwise, that we, we would have some ability to continue to debate forward. I, at least that's how I understand it. And, and it's difficult, if not impossible, to proceed with the debate if you don't have some specific things to try to uh, discuss or try to prove up. So it's not just the criteria, but it's also does the redevelopment plan satisfy the objectives of the act? You know, yeah. so you could. Uh, I don't know that you're prepared to do that today. This can be continued um, to, you know, for you to come up with maybe some language or whatever, and you know, we can type it up if that's what. But. <clears throat> You know, actually, in the on the dais the proposed resolution to approve it, there is not a corresponding resolution to disapprove it. Obviously, you think it meets the criteria. You may disagree, but then you should, you know, uh, have a basis. That's what the statute calls for. That's the next item on the agenda. It's really just the Joint Review Board. Now, I know you have some constituents there, so I think take questions. or some board members, so if you want to do that, I think we could allow It'd be them. fine to do that. I mean, nobody has, every, I think everybody here is a member of an elected body or, and everybody's represented here, so if there's questions from the audience, I, in the past we've done that. Yeah, and and where they're affiliated with is good. Uh, Jay Lane Miller, uh, trustee of the Park Protection District. I just had a question. Can, have, can we have a copy of the statute of the uh, regarding the, that we have to respond as a district or a municipality uh, in what regards we have to respond? Hey, this is it. If, and we can provide it to you get one page or two pages. That's actually Brian excerpted from the uh, packet that right. uh, each of the members on the uh, It's in your packet, Jay, in the front, that joint review board procedure. Yeah, that's an but excerpt. we can certainly send you the, the TIF Act itself. I'm sure we can copy it and send I it to you. The joint review board provisions are combined with. Uh, the public hearing requirements, but that's at 65 ILCS 11 74.4 5. And it's in there. I can give you my copy and I can always get another copy. But it's, it's some of that language is in there. And I can leave that with, uh, with your chief today. Thanks.
I'd like to uh, thank the village staff for the work they put in here. I'm very familiar with the, the work of Kane Kenna in my banking career. So I will guarantee you that they say it has those six criteria in there. <laughs> hopefully it's hopefully it is still being recorded. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the comments I have is one again, it's almost in business. You basically know what you're going to do before you look for the financing. This looks like we're putting the cart in front of the horse once again. Uh, in this plan, it does tell us what we can do. It does not tell us what we will do. Some of the areas that concern me are $2 million, and I know it's just budgeted, for purchase of the land. Will that land be current owned commercial land that then gets taken off the tax rolls? The other question I have is on our projection from going from $18.5 million to $30, $35 million in EVA is how much is that from the recovery of our economy? We are using the five worst years since the Great Depression. So when you say there is no impact on the entities, that incremental increase from the economy is an impact that that would be commercial taxes that we would receive in our cases. The other item is, I uh, want to know, is how much of this would be, again, for items like lamps and hanging baskets, which make our village look nice, but do not add at all to our tax base. Now, I've been on the board of the library for 24 years, and at the beginning of that service, we did support the tip district for the downtown. Um, we even supported the extension of that district and basically saw the mad rush at the end to spend some of those funds before they were given back to us. This appears again to be, wait, trust us for 22 years and we'll see how it goes. Um, I also, from business, would like to see, as you mentioned, this is a finance plan, not a operational plan. But we should have some benchmarks, mileage that's against. What do we expect to happen in the first, second, fifth year? And the main thing is, if we are not meeting those projections for the returning value or the expansion of the EBA that is projected, how do you terminate this early? That's not in here, okay? In the past TIF district, the village staff did a fine job of looking at stuff and projecting things. So we should have some idea of what we would like to do in this area. As for modern planning, I will point to you across the street on the vacancy rate in our modern planning versus some of the historical buildings that you can't touch because they have that designation. Now it has been argued, whether with Benjamin Franklin or Albert Einstein, who first defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I do not see anyone in this village that has insanity. The only other thing is, I basically, from what I've heard here today, you know, my pity is to this board, because they have basically thrown every obstacle in your way to say no. The library board on Monday, because of these factors, did pass a resolution opposing this TIF district. And we have, Carolyn has those available. It is not the district itself, or what could be done here, but the draft we had to review. So if some of those changes were made, we might change our position. Thank you.
Yes. Yes. I'll make a motion we approve it. Second. Let's do a roll call. Do a point of order. Pardon? Point of order? Sure. If we wanted to uh, reconvene in a set period within the parameters of, of you know, the timetable laid out, I think it would probably be in two or three weeks. What would be the process for that? Uh, I think we should agree on a date uh, to continue this for that purpose. Um, three weeks might be a little tough uh, because of that default uh, 30 days, and the village under the statutes allowed time to kind of address. So, for instance, a library board uh, has some seen it, but alluded to the fact that there's specific concerns that they would want to see addressed. So the good news is we could see those. Uh, but, you know, yes, you can pick a specific date. Right now on the floor is the motion to approve it. Um, and there could be a motion to postpone that definitely to a specific yeah, date. Yeah, that would uh, procedurally, uh, that would have a, uh, under Robert's rules of order, have priority, uh, so you could make that motion. Okay, I'd move to uh, postpone consideration of item nine uh, to a specific date that we can determine here, and continue this joint review board meeting to uh, let's pick a date and add that to the motion. Yes. I have a calendar right here. It has to be within 30 days. Hmm? It has to be within 30 days. Oh, yeah. So. This is a point of order. You had a motion on the floor. Did it fail or pass or your? Um, it, it, there's a second motion that has priority over the motion to pass. On porch, or no, it has priority. So, uh, that motion has to be voted on first, and if that passes, then it would be continued. Um, if it doesn't pass, then the motion on the floor proceeds, which is to pass the resolution. Possibly May 7th, which is two weeks in a day. That's May 12th. The 20th is a Wednesday. How about the th Thursday the 14th? I can't do it. May 14th? That's too far. It's too far. If you go beyond the 30 days, it's approved. Yeah, that's not 30 days. That's not 30 days. You want to be less than 30 days. That's not you want to meet sooner rather than later. And the 14th is at least a week less than a month. So, you know, two weeks would be the 6th, and you were suggesting what, the 13th? 14th. 14th. One of our members needs it past the 12th. Pardon? Oh. No, one of our members needs. Uh, okay. Gentlemen? I can't do the 14th. Uh, you know, if you want to add that the date to your motion. May 14th at 1 p.m.?
to you amend your motion. I'll restate my motion. And uh, I'd like to postpone consideration of item 9 uh, until Thursday, May 14th at 1 p.m. Yes. I'll second that motion. Okay. So there's a roll call then on that motion. Yes. 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 Courtney Pope from Cook County. Yes. Jeff King. Yes. No. <laughs> and Donna's vote. No. Motion carries. This and next meeting. Point, the next step would be that continued meeting, and then I think we identified after that is the public hearing on uh, June second. But the next step would really be uh, the continued meeting, and we'll get a notice out, a reminder notice. Uh, this may be the same location. Do we have in the record uh, what was submitted by the library district? What the resolution? The, the Board it passed. I think it was handed up. Can we make that a part of the record? Well, you could submit it for the record. Yeah. That'll be received in the record. We have to have a motion to include it. Hmm? We have to have a motion. No. A second. Okay. Well, essentially, you made a motion to uh, adjourn and reconvene for that date. So we're, we're basically adjourned. I think that motion serves as the adjournment to reconvene on that day. Thank you. Come over back out. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I'll send my staff. Oh, there you go.